He saw its potentials. He saw its meaning. And he transformed uh, something that was apparently worthless into a thing of great worth because of his own understanding. Sometimes he was able to insinuate a wonderful whimsical quality. Sometimes he caricatured. Sometimes he released a great reverence through what he did. But everything that he saw was interesting. And as a result of that, there were no longer any flat places in his universe at all. And this again has to do with the concept of value so that we can uh, not judge things to be valuable because of a social status, but things of value because they're meaningful. And when we travel, for instance, among Oriental peoples again, I think in China we find a good deal of this, and also in Korea and Japan, the value, for example, of something as commonplace as cooking suddenly becomes tremendous. The Zen monk will tell you that illumination can occur in the kitchen much more frequently than it will in the living room. Why? Because you are, you are working with values. And when a Chinese dinner is prepared, the first thing it is, it must appear to be a work of art. I don't know exactly what Hiroshige would think of a television uh, frozen plate ensemble, but I rather suspect that it would turn his stomach. He would have a really hard time finding the value in that one. He probably could do it, but it would really take work. But to the Oriental, the first part of a good meal is its appearance. The food comes in with every indication that it has been put there by somebody who wanted it to be there, who enjoyed putting it there, and who found a great deal of self-expression in transforming this plate into a work of art. There was real loving artistry there. Now we have no time for that. But what else are we doing with the time? Nothing. But we just figure that that kind of time is something we should get away from just as quickly as possible. That isn't good time. That's burden. Now the next thing that the Orientals will do will tell you that when you have stopped looking at this plate, the aroma of it is going to rise to your nostrils. And as the Chinese say, the good meal must smell like the incense of heaven. Well now... I don't know as many of our kick, uh, cookbooks give the recipe for that, but it means that we are also thinking in terms of the aromas of food. And when we get past the aroma of food, then we, uh, we come to the next situation that comes, uh, very important. The eyes. Color. Color. Certain colors must go together. You do not uh, put a wilted mashed potato alongside of a dilapidated turnip. <laughs> Both of which looked they were as though they were much too much the worse for too long residence in the deep freeze. Uh, we don't do that. There has to be artistry. Then texture. When you start biting it, it must not all bite like stale gravy. You, uh, it, should, it should be flavorful. It should be these things. And if it is these things, then it is a work of art. If it is a work of art, it is soul culture. And also, it's quite possible that if it looks well, tastes well, we know the person who did it enjoyed doing it, the foods are well combined, and our whole nature is happy, it might even prevent ulcers because we would have pleasure and we know that everything involved was pleasant. Now, the Oriental cooks his food very quickly. He does not cook it too much. Most of his food is a little to us on the undercooked side. But he preserves crispness and flavor and shape. He doesn't boil out color. 
and he doesn't put in a little of this and a little of that to restore the color artificially. He does it very simply, very quickly, and it is a lovely meal. This is moral value. It is the thing he enjoys. It has become an essential part of his life to think this way and to live this way. It is clothing the same way. One of the great problems that we have faced in the West is this constant shifting of styles, most of which are utterly unflattering. Uh, in most other countries, the folk costuming of the people for centuries maintained quality, artistry, and suitability. There was very little competition in the uh, individual consciousness. Good clothes never went out of style. There was no waste of money or waste of time involved. In Japan today, children going to school wear uniforms. Now, the uniform is uh, perhaps a little dated, perhaps a little strange. But what does it mean? The Japanese answered it very definitely. No more broken-hearted school children because they can't buy the expensive clothes that other school children wear. It doesn't make any difference whether you're the uh, daughter of the prime minister or the daughter of the most common laborer. You dress alike. There is no broken-hearted laborer's daughter that has to be contended with later. These things are, are very simple, and we never get around to them. We have to keep life complicated. Ultimately, we have to grow up some way. We have to mature into something besides a frenzied rush toward an unknown destiny. If we keep on this way, we will not even live to die in peace. We will more or less fall apart en route. <laughs> there won't be very many people in our generation who will be able to accomplish what Grandma Moses did, and I understand that she passed today at 101. She had been in this world since the administration of Abraham Lincoln. She must have seen a great many changes, and I imagine that she would be one who would admit that some of these changes were not all they should have been. But in uh, trying to build back into our lives, each person has something that is his own, if it's only a 12-foot room. He has a little world in which he can do what he pleases, if it pleases him to do anything. He can bring something of grace into his personal life. I know individuals who, for example, uh, travel a great deal. Some of them have no real homes at all, but they are art lovers, and wherever they go, they carry something by which, in an instant, they can bring art to a hotel room, or a boarding house, or a motel, wherever they are. They bring something that is essentially shibui with them. They carry it as religiously as they carry their extra clothes. And they would rather be caught without their extra clothes than not to have this something that moves a universe of value into their lives. And there is no one who cannot do these things to some degree. And there is no reason why it should ever really cause very much consternation. Many of these things can be done entirely privately, and yet they mean the difference between a, a conscious restatement every day of a conviction and the uh, problem of allowing ourselves to drift into utter mediocrity. So living constantly in the presence of value means that we are always ready to sacrifice a little something for the niceness of something that we do, something that we have, something that we believe. And little by little, this type of life does insinuate itself into all parts of our consciousness. If the mere accumulation of something of value merely left us the same and the proud owners of something, it would have no meaning. But as we sacrifice for value, as we gradually gain the ability to discriminate between those things which 
are most satisfying to consciousness. When we achieve this, uh, we begin to change our temperaments. Our tempers begin to relax a little. Our attitudes become a little more harmonious. For once the artist is born in our souls, we cannot do things that are not artistic. Criticism is not artistic. Criticism isn't beautiful. Criticism will never make a wonderful picture of Fuji against the sky. Criticism is something that deforms and shatters and breaks. Therefore, we cannot afford it. And as we begin to sense the possibility of true peace within ourselves, we don't want to disturb it by such attitudes. Intolerance isn't beautiful. It adds nothing. It may satisfy a momentary whim, but all it does is break a beautiful image of some kind. Intolerance makes us poorer, makes us cheaper in our own consciousness. And once we begin to value consciousness, we do not want this kind of a situation to arise. Hypocrisy is the same. We cannot live with it. We become more and more dependent upon an orderly existence. We do not wish to experience certain things. If we have to, we will, but we don't choose to. In Japan, Zen has for many years, for centuries, been the philosophic belief of the military sect of Japan. These were people who had to fight and die for their lords, their daimyos, and their tycoons. These people didn't always have the opportunity to live peacefully, but they did have the privilege of living graciously and dying graciously. They made life into one pattern of value to them. And this value meant to these people that most of all they must be true to that which they regarded as most valuable. If they regarded honor as most valuable, they had to be willing to die for it. If they had uh, believed religion to be most valuable, as in the case of several emperors, several emperors of the Fujiwara dynasty, after they reached a certain age, absolutely, voluntarily abdicated and became monks. They didn't want to hold on to this temporal power to the last day of life. They didn't want to hold on to wealth until it was tucked away in the casket with them. They reached a certain point. They had lived a fairly useful or busy and perhaps eventful life. They simply turned to the court around them and said, Gentlemen, I am retiring. The remaining years of my life I shall give to meditation and prayer and to the cultivation of the beauty of my own soul. This is now far more important than ruling a kingdom. And they meant it, and they did it. We talk about it, but very seldom do we do these things, because we would like to cling to something that is not value. As we get older, the need for value becomes perhaps even more pressing upon us. Our ambitions begin to slip away. The probabilities of the vast projects that we started with have become dim. Our own energies are not, sub, are not suitable to maintain the tempo with which we have associated successful living. And so it is very important that we begin to develop value. It is necessary that we retire from the world as Hiroshige did and take holy orders. But it is very suitable for us uh, to begin to be more and more conscious of value. Uh, be conscious of these things which are satisfying to consciousness and which will help us uh, to uh, meet the long afternoon of years with real composure, real understanding, and real peace of soul. So value becomes increasingly significant to Western man because he really has never known much about it. And this program and everything it has to do with it certainly has to be spearheaded by thoughtful people. And I've wondered over many years how it is that so few people interested in philosophy or interested in mysticism or even esotericism have sensed the, the tremendous advantage of the simple love of beauty in the development of the spiritual life. Uh, rather, they have 
followed the traditional pattern of Western man and rather made beauty, made uh, the religious life unbeautiful. They felt that it had to be a severity, a penance, uh, that the holy images had to be symbols of deprivation and pain. They have never really sort of sensed that the good life, the spiritual life, the life which unfolds the internal power of man is the beautiful and the gracious life. They have, they have not sensed that goodness and beauty have an essential identity. And as a result, the, uh, the goodness gets a rather cramped appearance and loses most of its immediate charm. Also, the individual himself can't get the same enthusiasm about being uncomfortable that he might get out of the expression of his own aesthetic consciousness. Archetypally, we do possess within ourselves something uh, that within the next 25 years, which is my solemn prediction, is going to dominate the entire field of scientific research, and that is the quest of the core consciousness in man. Psychology is already bankrupt as far as its present patterns are concerned. It cannot and does not go far enough. It must go further. And as it goes further, what is it going to find? It is inevitably going to be forced to approach what might be called the unit consciousness which lies behind all the phenomena of the human mind and of the entire series of psychic reflexes in man. It's all right to talk about the id and the libido. It's all right to talk about the anima and the animus. It is all right to consider the numerous divisions of the human psyche. But behind, beyond this, there is the unity of consciousness upon which these, upon which these depend for their existence. There is a oneness at the root of diversity. And this oneness is consciousness. And it is this consciousness that must be found, that must be understood before the purpose for man's existence can be defined. Now this consciousness is not really, as the Zen monk has pointed out, not really as inaccessible as we have made it appear to be. We have surrounded this consciousness with a mass of, st of straw men, images that we have built up which we have now to knock down before we can get to the facts. We have placed in our own estimation between consciousness and our daily living a vast interval of complexities, and we have been uh, gradually groping our way through these complexities. And every time we touch another complexity, we think this is the ultimate. It is not. Behind it lies this great sea of simplicity, which is consciousness itself. We can and must learn how to get this consciousness into action. It is there, it is naturally and inevitably like water flowing downhill, moving into our objective existence. And then somewhere along the line we distort it, deform it, mutilate it so that by the time it gets into manifestation it is comparatively meaningless to us. Uh, we do the same thing in ourselves. We have a root consciousness which we do not understand and do not know. And by the time it has passed through the mental and emotional complexes of our personality, it has become a completely deformed thing, incapable of providing us with any basic integration, but simply animating a mass of complexes. The uh, Oriental mind knew this, recognized it, Buddha realized it 2,600 years ago. He knew there was only one answer to this. And that is that the individual must begin to make possible the manifestation of this inner consciousness through a relaxed, available human personality. That if we use consciousness, consciousness will become beautiful in us. If we abuse it, it will become a deformed thing, leading us to sickness and destruction. So we must find this consciousness. And the only way we can think of it and the way we believe it is that this consciousness is 
the archetypal universal life. It is also carrying within itself the absolute law of its own existence. Therefore, consciousness per se is absolute life, absolute law, and absolute order. What does this mean in substance? It simply means that it is absolute beauty. For law is the basis of beauty. And beauty is lawfulness. It is the thing as it should be and as it must be. And those who are able to dis discover the highest standards of beauty are those who have come the nearest to sensing the real structure of universal law. It would then seem quite reasonable and probable that if we are able to release these patterns into conduct, that we will not have these psychic stress situations that we now go through. We go through the conflict between an eternal pattern that must have its own and our purposes, which are in conflict with this pattern, and our psychic life is a battlefield for the rest of our years. If, however, we seek the life of value, we stop dictating to consciousness. We stop telling consciousness what it is supposed to believe, which actually is pure audacity because we have no idea of what it is supposed to believe. And we become receptive to allow consciousness to express its own divine geometry in our minds, in our emotions, and in our actions. Actually, the appreciation of beauty is due to the consciousness we possess. The creation of beauty is due to consciousness. And the life of beauty is a life lived in consciousness with the values of the inner dominating the problems of the outer. If we can ever get into this situation, we have reasonable security. We will not be perfect. Man is not yet fashioned for such ends. But we will have an integration. We will not be just average people. We will be normal people. We will be the human being who is free. We will be the free man. We will no longer be a slave to our mistakes. And being free of our own mistakes, we are now free to become masters of the liberal arts and sciences. We are free to settle down to the conscious problems of self-improvement. Now, I insist that this is possible, even though it may not be consistent in every respect with the daily problems that we face. The mere fact that there is this inconsistency, and that to a certain measure the problems around us cannot be changed, that the importance of changing ourselves is brought home to us. We each of us live in two worlds a world of things around us and a world of things within us. In the world of things around us, it appears that we have to follow the advice of Jesus, who said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are his. And we have this twofold life. We have to render certain service uh, to the material world to which we belong. If we do not, others must do our work for us, and this is not right. But we also have a certain responsibility to an inner life. And there is, there is no one who cannot do something with his inner life, even while he is living in the outer world. He has some way of compensating. Home is a compensation, unless it is destroyed. All forms of avocational creative activity can be compensatory, unless we choose them so badly and practice them so unwisely that they are meaningless. But always, everywhere, the individual can begin this solemn quest of the beautiful. He can live in a determination to improve his own consciousness release it into manifestation through conduct. He has several things he can do. Realizing that universal law is beauty, that what we call virtue is moral beauty, that harmony is tonal or structural beauty, that uh, value is aesthetic beauty, 
Realizing all this, we can slowly eliminate from our practice by personal endeavor those things which in themselves are obviously not beautiful, things which dis deform, disparage, or destroy beauty are simply not safe for us uh, to do. And uh, little by little, we realize that while we are at outs with everyone else, we cannot be at ins with ourselves. We cannot have peace of soul while we live in a conflict relationship with life. Now, we may say that other people have imposed upon us, we may say that other people are unkind. These things may, as far as we know, be absolutely true. But at the same time, if we permit these happenings to come into our inner life, we are going to wreck ourselves. The thing that the other person did to us is not what is making us sick. It's the fact that we cannot handle the incident. We cannot transform this incident into something valuable. We cannot uh, rise above the occurrence in our own consciousness. If we could, it would no longer be a source of problem. So that's one area in which we try to accomplish something. And we need example. We need help in this. We need the moral support of the firm realization that there is good, there is beauty, and there is truth at the root of life. To find this, we simply have to tune it in, for it is always here. To find it, we must acknowledge it, admit it, reflect upon it. And the moment our consciousness turns in that direction, the futility which binds us breaks its bonds and we are free. The actual fact remains that man can discover anytime, anywhere, that the universe is just. He can know as an inner experience the inevitable victory of good over evil. He can inwardly understand the mystery of his own immortality. These things can be achieved within himself, not necessarily by a great laborious program of self-improvement, but by a very simple relaxing away from darkness and toward light. It merely means a refocusing of interest and attention. Sometimes it merely means doing something, because it is in this nothingness of our activity that worries and sorrows and griefs take over. Nearly always the person most burdened with negations is simply the person who has no available store of positive consciousness. He is, has nothing good to think about. That is why he can be easily moved into a negative attitude. Rather than this, let him have good things to think about. This in itself will use up time and energy and free him from the uh, from the occasion which will permit him to go into the doldrums. I know cases very definitely where persons have gone home to an empty apartment night after night and come very close to a complete nervous breakdown. They went into a dark room where no one was waiting for them. They got more sorry for themselves every day. Uh, they got in there and they found nothing but a bunch of apartment house uh, furnishings with nothing personal, nothing of value to them as individuals. They sat down in front of a radio. They hardly knew anyone to call on the phone. And in a little while, these lonely people became the absolute victims of their own isolation. For in that dull, gloomy atmosphere, untouched by the light of any value in themselves, except self-pity, they gradually went to pieces, until actually it was necessary to take heroic steps to get them out of these places. 
they couldn't recover themselves. They sank deeper and deeper into the slough of despond with every passing day. They didn't want to go home anymore. They actually were afraid to go home. I've had people here come to see me within the last three months who actually admitted they were afraid to go home. Not because of an ogre there, but because of nobody there. One of them said if the devil was there, it would help. It was simply this situation of there being nothing but themselves to live with and their own condition extremely incompatible. Now, there's, there's no reason why the development of value in a life like that cannot be just as complete as the development of non-value by a series of negative, meaningless, worthless attitudes they got themselves into a situation in which they were in danger of, their, of losing their sanity. If you can do this to yourself to hurt yourself, it is also well within the power of everyone to do even more than that to themselves that will help them. Actually, the whole situation lies in attitudes. And it is perfectly possible for this individual to find in this little room his own world, a world where there are th countless beautiful things he can do and think. But he's dependent on the wallpaper and the furniture to do it for him. This isn't what happens. It is the light within himself. Even though the furniture might be a little off color, if his own light strikes it, it'll look much better. The real darkness is not in the room, but in his own nature. But where it is dark in him and dark in the room, and the two darknesses come together, there is great misery. But this person could, in some way, make this little world a haven of rest and protection, a place where there is no longer any need for subterfuge, where pretense is unimportant, where we don't have to cater to the whims of people who don't understand, but strangely in this little dark room we find freedom. We find the right to be ourselves. The only trouble is we don't appreciate the freedom because we have really no consciousness of what kind of selves we want to be. We, the, the self that meets us in that room is not pleasant, but it could be. Because actually, this is our leisure, this is our time. So we go about trying to do something about it. One individual tried to solve it, and to a measure did solve it. The moment they got home, they turned on all the lights, turned on the radio at the top sound that the neighborhood would permit, and immediately got frantically busy doing something. This was regarded as a positive therapeutic step. They felt pretty proud about that. Of course, they kept this up until they fell into a complete exhaustion and then went to bed. They went to bed a little too early. They didn't sleep all night. Here was nothing. Another person said, well, I've got it solved. I come home, put on a nice, soft light, slip on some nice, comfortable things, and then I sit down and read. These individuals have read thousands of pages, not really because their primary object was to know something, but their primary object was to forget themselves. So they read, and they read, and they read. But you would think that sometime, with that amount of reading, they'd graduate, but they never did. <laughs> Ten years later, they were still reading, and they, they still didn't dare put the book down. Because after ten years of reading, they now had a habit, and all they had to do was stop reading and be utterly miserable. They didn't know what else to do. So here were all these kinds of mechanisms by which the person is trying to rationalize the fact that perhaps he'd like to come home to a nice sunny situation with a house full of friends and everything would be gay and wonderful. Actually, many people come home to that also and are totally miserable. So it, uh, there's, no, there's no guarantee on this one way or another. There's, uh, there is no proof that if these people had others around them, they would be any different. But they think they would. And that is a consolation in their souls anyway. 
But here is the chance for beauty. Here's a chance, uh, perhaps, for a little creative self-expression, which helps tremendously. Instead of reading or turning on something or listening to something, you do something so that your own conscious activity is involved. This is very vital to, me, to most people, particularly those who do not have very well-occupied lives. But there's also this constant coming to appreciate. Now, to appreciate, you have to have meaning and purpose. You have to build a little conspiracy, a benevolent one, in your life. Otherwise, things don't operate. Now, here's one example of uh, why I think art helps in these things and why art has been uh, closely related with, uh, to uh, Shabui for hundreds of years. An individual who takes an interest in art begins to get questions. He goes down to a little store somewhere and he finds a mysterious little something or other. Uh, with our Western perspective, we're not quite sure what it is. But it's rather intriguing, and it's within our price range. In fact, it's been marked down, which makes a very great inducement to purchasing it. Uh, and we get it. And it looks like it might be interesting. So we stand it around somewhere, and in the course of time, this little thing begins to cry out, What do I mean? Who am I? Why have you got me? After a little time, this kind of nagging situation that sets up maybe sends us to the library or to the bookstore to buy a book about it. We'd like to know what we have. Perhaps we start out and hoping that we have a treasure that is worth enough for us to retire on. Usually we will be disillusioned on that point. But it does offer a, an intriguing situation. And we discover that we have, well, perhaps we have a sword guard. We didn't know what it was. It looked a little like a napkin ring, but it turned out to be a sword guard. But it was rather interesting. It was interestingly shaped, nicely designed, a lot of artistry on it. So we took this sword guard of Tsuba and we, we got a book on it. And we hadn't had the book for long before we suddenly realized that there was a whole world of this subject. That the art of these uh, guards, tremendously interesting. That they were adorned with the most wonderful symbols. That the symbols meant something and that all kinds of designs of philosophy and art and literature of Buddhism, of Shintoism, of Taoism are on these sword guards and that they were made at different times and that some of them are signed and some of the artists were very interesting people and if you happen to find one with this artist signature on it uh, suddenly it seems as though a bridge may be built across three centuries and we seem to touch the interesting dramatic person who created this object long ago Little by little, we, we begin to get intrigued by it. And uh, the first thing you know, we come home and we, we're kind of anxious to get home because we, we'd like to go a little further into that subject. Or we rush home and uh, have a quick meal and rush down the public library so we can find out something more about our little purchase. And little by little, this thing leads us. Perhaps after a little while we decide that sword guards are not the thing we've always wanted to collect, but we've now become aware of collecting. And in the course of reading a sword guards, we find there are only chapters in larger books on other subjects, and something else catches our eye. Pretty soon we want to begin to know about these things. Uh, we decide that it might be nice to have several good examples. Well, that opens another problem. They've been copied badly, and most of them are probably forgeries. How are we going to protect ourselves? How are we going to know a good one? We have to study it. We have to study to know a good painting, study to know a good print, study to know a, general, a genuine piece of old ivory, study to determine the quality of jade, study to know whether a bronze was made last year and buried or whether it's really 300 years old. The challenge of this thing begins to catch up to us and a world begins to open. A world which is essentially a world of the search for real values, a world of discrimination in which we begin to learn why simplicity is great, a world of observation where if we overlook a minor detail we may be victimized, Gradually, the whole process of life becomes more thorough. 
And we don't do this very long before somebody drops by and says, my, you have an interesting collection of these things, and then you're in your element. Then you can explain them all. You've studied them for three months and you're an expert, whereas the other person hasn't studied them at all and stands in awe of your learning. Uh, perhaps, however, somewhere along the line, he asks an embarrass embarrassing question, and after he's gone, you're back again trying to find the answer to that one. But you have slowly built a world. Now, you can say to yourself, well, this isn't an important world. No one really cares whether I collect sword cards or not. But it's a little more important than to be able to say, nobody cares whether I worry myself to death or not. Because actually, uh, whenever you learn, you are adding to the complete structure of your own knowledge. A two-week expedition into, into Chinese ivories may be a little facet way away from your common life. But from the time you have understood these things that much, and have given that amount of time to them, they become a part of your total psychic chemistry. You are a little more wise. You are a little better judge of something. You are a little more observant. And this affects your entire consciousness. And as this develops gradually, you begin to, to sense value. And if you have friends, you begin to select between these friends. If you have an interest, you are not interested in uninteresting people. And people who are constantly interested in uninteresting people generally worry together, or fuss together, or devote themselves to tearing down somebody else's reputation. But if you are interested in interesting people, you will learn something from them every day. Of course, you can learn from the uninteresting ones, too, but that is a negative type of lesson. It's a constant warning saying, be not like them. But it is much often much more interesting uh, to find that as your own consciousness stretches out into a positive pattern of some nature, you begin to contact others who have done the same thing, who have similar interests, who are also on that level of understanding. And first thing you know, you have a very interesting kind of life. I knew a man lived alone for a great many years, and uh, someone asked him one day, he said, aren't you a little tired of living alone the way you do? He said, I certainly am not. He said, the only thing that worries me is I don't have time enough. He said, every, he said, every evening I have my interests. I'm doing something. I'm researching something. I'm creating something. I, I know that I'm not going to be here too much longer, and I'm going to get all the information I can before I go. He says, I sit down with one of my little projects, and he says, heavens, I look at the clock, one o'clock in the morning. You know, the whole evening's gone. He says, a little bit uh, guiltily, I crawl into bed. You know, the question with me is not, how long am I going to sit alone in this room? The question with me is, uh, am I going to stop long enough to sleep? Everything is interesting. Into this little room he had brought a world of interests, a world of creative things. And this person, you seldom have ever heard him complain about anything. He wasn't critical of other people. He had found a very interesting and delightful creativity. And time was just too short for him. He begrudged the hours he slept, because they interfered with things that he liked to do. But it all happened in an inexpensive one-room apartment. He didn't have any wealth, he didn't have any of these things, but he had interests, and within a moderate area, he was able, by economizing in other matters, to serve these primary interests. And they were so strong in him that the economies didn't mean anything. They were what he wanted to do. Everyone can do this to some degree, and it will make them better philosophers. It will make them more understanding, more sensitive people. You study some of these subjects for six months, and then someone starts talking to you about Zen, and you have a knowledge of it you cannot have otherwise, because perhaps you have worked with objects that were created by Zen artists. You know now why they did them the way they did. You sense something of the feeling of meditation from the very object. You have found friendship in it. You have found satisfaction of soul because the person who designed it had that satisfaction of soul himself. He was able to put it in. And it's perfectly possible for an expert to tell 
almost immediately the degree of enlightenment of an artisan or an artist in any product that he makes. So little by little, this light of life shines more brightly. Problems slip away. We don't have time for them. Worries are not as obsessive as they used to be. Instead of that, we have a constant enjoyment and out of this much better psychological integration the happy person is capable of a good religious life the unhappy person is not the individual who is driven to religion by his miseries is a poor candidate the individual who comes to religion because he he joyfully uh, wants the experience of religion is an entirely different problem in uh, the, for instance, in many of the Japanese Buddhist sects, um, uh, the sect founded by Honen is one of the most outstanding examples. Throughout Buddhism, no one ever prays for anything. They simply pray in the sense of making a statement of gratitude. A prayer is an offering of words. It is not a requirement. Just as a man brings a little bowl of rice or a little fruit to the altar, he brings of what he has and gives. He is not there to gain. He is there to give. As uh, Honan, before his passings, pointed out, uh, that actually there is only one attitude we need to take toward the universe. And that is the attitude of gratitude. There is nothing that we actually need that is not available to us if we are willing to earn it and to live the life that makes it possible. We don't have to be, uh, to be, to be praying for the forgiveness of sins. If we're real people, we'll correct our own mistakes. The Buddhist does not believe in forgiveness of sin in the ordinary sense that we mean in the West here. Buddhist doesn't believe in saying, Dear Lord, I, I need uh, some supper money. Uh, this isn't his idea of religion at all. His religious concept is that the creating power of the universe has fashioned him, equipping him with the most marvelous instrument that the world has ever known giving him within himself the power to gaze into the heavens, to contemplate the mystery of his own existence, to understand life about him, to work and to play and to bear children and to make a rich and beautiful region for himself, to have a little home and a rice field. And on the days of feasting and celebration, he has the right to go out with his family and sit under a beautiful tree somewhere and look at Fujisan. What more is there that any reasonable person can ask? Therefore, why should we request things? We do not ask to live longer because we know we cannot die. Death is merely a change of worlds. We do not ask other people to be kind to us. It isn't necessary. Our only problem is, are we kind to them? And if we are right in our own hearts, we will be protected by our own attitudes. There is nothing that we can ask for that we cannot earn, that is not available to us if we live right. Therefore, we, the Buddhist simply makes some little statement like the Nembutsu, adoration to Amida Buddha, and that is his prayer. He may repeat it several times, deeply concentrating upon the blessedness of the life he has known, of the good things that have been possible to him, of the simple fact of, of his own life. He has been a conscious being. He could reach out and touch the world. He could reach out and bridge intervals. He could sit with his friends and drink tea and write a poem. What more is there? All this other is just simply confusion. Well, we can't completely simplify it away, but I think even this attitude on prayer certainly carries kihin in it. It has great moral value. It is the, not the idea that man is a slave or a servant of the universe, that he must ask for everything that he needs. Actually, he 
already has everything that he needs. All he has to do is guard it wisely and lovingly. The world has produced everything that is necessary to him. It is his own foolishness and his own selfishness that has made trouble, and that alone he can cure. Now before the Ravala, Buddha called his disciples together and he said, My brethren, I leave you with this admonition. Work out your salvations with diligence. Each individual must save himself from himself. This is the law. So with this, what more is there necessary except the gracious fact that we can stand as human beings and admit to the sovereign power that we know we are blessed, that we know and appreciate the wonderful mystery of our own existence. Therefore, it is necessary for us to beg. It is only necessary for us to realize the Bodhisattva ideal, namely, that it is our right to give, to share, to make a beautiful world, to help all who need. Not because we come as an answer to prayer, but simply because this is the way that is natural to the enlightened human being. It's all so simple, and we've made it so complicated. So in our daily living, perhaps we are especially fortunate if we do not have too many personal problems crowding in on us. Uh, perhaps if we are just a little on the lonely side, we are especially blessed because we have freedoms that perhaps we wouldn't have had we more immediate responsibilities. If we have earned these freedoms, they are good, but they are not good if they are the result merely of evasion. One example of this freedom, all through Asia, India, every other country recognizes it, is the freedom that comes to the family when the children grow up. Uh, by the time the children reach majority, uh, the family now enters into its most fruitful period. Every essential duty to society has been met. The man who was brought into the world has paid his debt. The family has met the responsibility that the ages invested in them. And from that time on, there is freedom. There is always a certain loving watchfulness, certainly. But uh, the, the last thing in the world these people want to do is move in on their children. The last thing they want to do is to try to continue to keep their grown children, teenagers, and do all their thinking for them. This is not uh, kihin. This is not moral value. The moral value is now that the individual has a right, uh, not by neglect, but by desert, to create his own inner life, to have more and more opportunity to mingle consciousness with the stars and with the growing green things of life so that to be brought to the point where we can devote our lives to the improvement of consciousness without slighting anything else without failing in any responsibility this is a most blessed achievement and today in our Western world, it is one of the most tragic things that can happen because we're utterly unprepared for it. We are unprepared to recognize the marvelous privilege of being able to direct our own lives toward the legitimate attainment of this right of the free man, the right to grow. When we are lifted of responsibilities, we are like the Roman who has been freed. And by this circumstance, we are entitled to go on to the contemplation of the great arts and sciences, which are the roots of universal knowledge. It's all in the attitude. It's all in the way in which we face things which we should be faced with graciousness and understanding. So if we can make that little change in our own perspective of, uh, toward life, we find that we do walk in the light, and that life is a gracious experience, and that everything that happens 
is a, is a marvelous initiation in value. And this, if we can realize it intimately in our own lives, will it contribute not only to happiness but to health and to practically every uh, important objective of our lives. I think we should give it an awfully deep concentration and give it a lot of real thinking because it means an awful lot to Western man and will mean more before this century is over. Well, time's up, so we have to stop with this little uh, rumination that we've been carrying through the last several evenings.